Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure. Let me first welcome uh, anybody who is here with us for the first time. I am excited that you're, uh, you're with us. Maybe someone told you about this program. Maybe you just stumbled upon it, and this is what's called a God incidence rather than a coincidence. But however you found us, I'm happy you're here, and I'm hoping that this program is a blessing to you, and perhaps you'll join us for all of our regular programs. Uh, and, and to the regular congregation, the people who are with us uh, every uh, you know, uh, uh, Sunday, Wednesday, and Friday, uh, thank you for being with us again. To the moderators in the chat room, thank you for being here to help out. Now, I, I have noticed that we have a particular troll who will go unnamed, but has a lot of different YouTube accounts just for the purpose of trolling. Uh, if you if you do encounter a troll in the chat room, uh, let's have zero tolerance. Uh, we're not here to entertain the trolls or engage them. We're here to study together. And I want everybody in the chat room to be focused on the topic that we're talking about, which is Romans chapter 8 right now. So uh, please, uh, all the moderators, um, I ask you to do two things. One is make sure you greet every person who's a, a, a new. If you recognize that they, they are new and you haven't met them before, go out of your way to uh, greet them and make sure they feel welcome. And then also, uh, don't let the trolls uh, interfere with our program. Brother Lou, now, could I say one yeah. thing about the trolls? Can we also make sure that the people we're shutting down really are trolls? Because I've had some people just ask questions. People thought they were being antagonistic, but they were just asking a question, and they were my viewers. And they're like, we weren't trying to start trouble. We seriously were asking a question, but people thought they were being antagonistic and blocked them. So can we just be just to take a minute yeah. to make sure they're not... You know, yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, it's it's not that we uh, uh, don't want to hear or entertain uh, questions or even different ideas. Uh, as long as someone's not challenging us on our core doctrines, and I mean, this is not the, a place to uh, have our chat room get sidetracked from the study to to argue with someone who's a lordship heretic. You know that we there's a time and place for that. Uh, but if someone has a question or, you know, give them a little bit of time to discern if this person is uh, has a legitimate questions or if they're here just to cause trouble. Uh, and I, I know that you have the ability to discern that. So uh, thank you. And that's a good point, Renee. All right. So now let's get to the introductions of uh, Renee and uh, Brother Cripps. Renee, you, if, if anybody doesn't know who you are, tell them, please. Hey guys, it's Renee Roland, channel of the same name. I contend for the gospel of the grace of God, which is the only gospel that saves. And I've been out sick in the hospital the last couple weeks. And I want to thank uh, Jason for being such a great host along with Luke. And I'm really excited to dive in with you guys tonight. I missed you all very much. All right. Yeah. Thank you, sister. We've missed you so much. Uh, also on our Sunday program, we've missed you. So every time you are able to be with us, I, not only are we happy, but I'm sure the whole congregation is thrilled when you're able to be here. And we'll keep praying for you, for your strong recovery of your health. Uh, Brother Cripps, uh, for those people who don't know you, tell them about you and your YouTube channel. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Jason Cripps, and I am part of the channel called True Story Live. We come on Sundays at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and I'm glad to be a part of this show on Wednesdays. And, Renee, thank you for the really, really graceful comment. It's been a, been a pleasure to be part of the program and to, uh, you know, do more than fill in, but certainly uh, to be here and uh, be supportive. And uh, Steve has filled in a couple times uh, for you as well, and that's been a pleasure. But we missed you, and we're so glad that you're here. Uh, so just a quick hello to everyone in the chat room. You guys are awesome. It's good to see a lot of uh, familiar faces and to see some new faces tonight, too. So welcome to the program, and I'm sure you're going to be encouraged. Thank you. 
All right, very well then. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll begin uh, with cha uh, chapter 8, verse 24. I'm going to read a few verses earlier so we have a little context leading into the verse. Uh, so let's uh, begin with uh, ch verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now, and not only they, but ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Now verse 24. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? Question mark. Um, all right, let me uh, say the question mark. Of course, we know that uh, we've mentioned many times that Paul uses question marks a lot. He asks a lot of questions. So, Renee, um, why don't you give us your thoughts on verse 24 and what leads up to it and, and uh, the answer to the question. Well, for one, Paul is doing again, what do you call it, prosopopoeia, but uh, a, a hypothetical statement. He's saying, hey, if the hope that we have was something that we could witness now, we wouldn't need to hope for it. But it's a hope that's been promised to us. It's a sure hope. It's not like, ooh, I hope so, got my fingers crossed. No, a hope meaning a sure looking forward to promise. So the hope we have is based on God's word and his promises. But because we don't have it manifest yet, we don't see it physically. We don't see it, you know, right now. It is a hope that we look forward to in the future, but it is a sure kind of hope. So he's saying, let me get over there to it. He said, but we are saved by hope. And that's a, a sure promise of God. But hope that is seen is not hope. He's saying if we had it now, we wouldn't need to look forward and hope for it. But the fullness of the manifestation of God's promise is not full yet. We haven't had our bodies redeemed yet is what he's saying. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope? He's saying, uh, if why would you need to hope if you could see it now? But we, we're looking forward to the day that we're free of these uh flawed sinful bodies and i'd like to remind people the old man versus the new man the old man is the flesh he is the one that still sins he will never be sinless he will never be perfect sin is condemned in this flesh this flesh dies this man dies but the new man the spirit man he is perfect because you must be perfect to enter heaven and so the hope that we're looking forward to that we do not yet see is God's promise that we will receive a glorified body that we won't struggle against. It won't be fallen. It'll be perfect and will be just like Jesus. That's why it says earlier that the whole world uh, groans and travails. It wants to be fully redeemed. Hmm. Uh, amen. Uh, Brother Cripps, what do you say about it? Well, well first, of all, first of all, I could just say ditto. I'm not going to do that, but I could just, <laughs> that was beautifully, beautifully said, Renee. Glad, sure, glad to have you back. Uh, yeah, I would agree that uh, certainly if we have something in our lives, like a car or a bed, we don't say, you know, I hope I hope my car's there in the morning. Oh, you know, I hope my bed's still there. Um, that's a poor analogy, but when it comes to Christ, uh, it, it is more than hope. Uh, for us. We're saved by the hope. We're not going to hope for something that we know we have. It's tangible. We're able to see it. We're able to feel it. Um, I would say, too, that the, our relationship with with God gives us more than, uh, uh, it's more than just wishing. It's a standard hope. Uh, it's, it's based on our experiences with him. It's based on the promises in the Bible. Um, he continues to work in our lives and it builds and builds and builds. Our hope can grow. And I, I love in Romans 5 where it says, uh, hope maketh not ashamed for the love of God is spread abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Um, so through the gift of the Holy Spirit, we're able to not be ashamed of hope. We cling to that hope. And Jesus said, uh, uh, blessed, are those, blessed are you that have seen me and believe. But uh, even more so, and uh, blessed are those that do not see and yet still believe. 
Um, so hope is something that that we should uh, delight in. We're, we delight in that hope. And I love the way that Renee connected it to uh, getting our spiritual bodies because at that point, yeah, we won't struggle anymore. Uh, we'll have experienced that and there'll, there'll be no need to hope anymore because we will have experienced. So it will change from hope uh, to a real certainty. So thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Um, there are some very important words in the scripture that are uh, often found uh, when explaining our uh, gift of salvation and eternal life. Uh, words like believe, faith, trust, hope. Uh, and then, as, as you said, Brother Cripps, the, the verse um, that you cited, um, when, when uh, Thomas doubted that Jesus was raised from the dead, even after everybody was excited and told him, he I says, I won't believe it until I see him and touch him, put my fingers in the wound. And, and, and then, of course, it played out that he did get the opportunity to see Jesus and touch him and... And Jesus made this very famous, uh, you know, statement that we should all un understand the importance of this, this point. Jesus said, okay, Thomas, now that you've seen me, you believe. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. And I think that, that uh, Renee, you fall into that group. And Brother Cripps, you fall into that group. I, I'm in that group. I have not seen Jesus, and yet I believe. And there's something about uh, believing without seeing that is really, really important to God. And, you know, I've given this a lot of thought and prayer to, to try to understand it. Uh, but God values, I, I guess the proper word to, to make sense of this is the word trust, okay? Uh, God values trusting him. And trusting means that, okay, we walk by faith, not by sight. We're not like Thomas, where we are requiring proof. Show me, Jesus, appear to me. I need to touch you or I'm not going to believe. No, we're, we're even though... Uh, we don't get to see and touch him. We're going to trust him anyway. And that's what God wants from us. The Bible says with, with, uh, is without faith, it is impossible to please God. So all of these things are related, and they make me conclude that the idea of, of, of believing, uh, faith, trusting, and hope, these things that uh, are all make the same point that God says, trust me, I'm not going to appear to you, but, uh, but I'm going to give you the scriptures. And, and, and of course, we have the historical record of the resurrection. The purpose of the resurrection <laughs> was to give us the proof. You know, the, the Jewish people, the religious leaders told Jesus, well, you've made a lot of claims. Prove it. Give us a sign. And Jesus said, well, I'll give you the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And, of course, this is referencing his death, burial, and resurrection. So Jesus promised that he would give us a bodily resurrection after his crucifixion as a proof sign that his claims are true. He is God. He is the Savior. He's the one that was promised to come. And that resurrection changed the apostles from cowards hiding for their lives to the most bold uh, preachers uh, in history, uh, willing to all die for their faith because uh, Jesus proved it to them. And now we have the witness of the apostles and the scriptures that they did see him and they all were willing to die for uh, be, be, because they, it was proven that he was raised from the dead. And so we have that uh, to give us confidence. Our, the Bible says that we're, we're, we're justified by the resurrection. That means that, that um, my uh, faith in Jesus is justified because, because he proved it. 
The resurrection is what proved it. Therefore, I'm justified in, have, in putting my faith in him. I, uh, I, it's a sensible thing to do because it was been proven. Now, the problem is, and I'm sorry, I'm going on, but uh, I'm, I, I want to draw a little bit of a distinction between all these words and this word hope. Because hope is a word that the lordship heretic says, aha, look at that. Hope is a different word than trust, believe, and faith in a, in a way. And so that means you can't have certainty. Like the Romanists will say, it's the sin of presumption. You can't presume that you're certain you're going to go to heaven. Uh, so they'll look at this, see this word hope, and now it gives them hope that their false doctrine is correct. Hey, you can't know, you can just hope. Uh, but uh, I'd like Ray and, and Brother Cripps to talk a little bit more about why we don't have to get alarmed because it says hope there. All right, Renee? Yeah, uh, again, the hope here is not talking about, ooh, I might. The hope here is a sure promise of God. So the hope is looking forward to something that we are certain is going to happen. So, I mean, it's as clear as that. God says that he has redeemed you. He's reconciled himself through Christ. And that one day you'll be saved from this body of death that you're fighting against, this old man. You'll be given a new body. This corruption will put on incorruption. This mortality will put on, in, on immortality. And that is a hope that is sure. The Bible talks about hope that is sure because we have a heart with full assurance of faith because we're standing on God's promises. So the hope is not a maybe based on something we do. The hope is a promise that we can guarantee is going to happen. So we're looking forward to that day. And he even talks about how the whole world is travailing and groaning for that day that the whole world will be redeemed and be uh, made anew. Because God has said it will be so, and therefore we hope for that truth, that promise that God has given us. And God cannot lie. So that hope is a sure hope. We are looking forward to something that we know is going to happen. Yes. I want to say a little bit more, but first, Brother Cripps, your thoughts on my, the point I made. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, I go back to the uh, Romans 5, uh, the, the verse that, that says uh, not to be ashamed of hope. Um, hope is a building thing. While, while you were talking, I was thinking about when I was a kid and my parents would, uh, you know, I'd have, I was going to school and I'd have the whole work week and then they'd give me something to look forward to on the weekend, whether it was to stay at a friend's house or whether it was uh, to go to the park and spend time together, whatever it was, something that I really looked forward to. And on Monday, maybe my hope, you know, wasn't as strong as it was, but as the days got closer and I knew that Saturday was coming, that hope that I had built, it would build and build and build until by Friday night, I couldn't wait until the next day to, to get to do whatever that thing was. And I think that's, it's like that with us. You know, when we first, uh, when we first start to believe and we, and, and we choose in faith to, to believe, that starts to build the hope in us. And as we start to think about these things, as Renee mentioned, the glorified body, and we, we uh, look forward to seeing our Savior, that hope starts to build and build. To me, it's not different than, I mean, it is a different meaning or a different word than faith than some of the other things that are described throughout the rest of Scripture. But it is that building that, uh, as, as uh, Renee said, it's, it's assured. It's like a sure hope. Uh, it's... it's uh, it, it continues to grow and grow. I know the, the closer I get to God, the more my hope builds, the more that something that started out as faith and believing what the Bible said becomes a tangible thing. And uh, also, again, the Holy Spirit is, you have a built-in uh, person with you that helps build that hope. So it's not based on just faith anymore. It, it's, an, it's an assured end to give us a promised end. And uh, gosh, the older I get, the closer I get to God, the more my hope builds. 
And uh, it's, it's, it's no longer just based on other things. It's based on an assured end, which I love. I, I like the way you uh, illustrated it with, uh, you know, hoping for this weekend to come. And it's, it's really, it's kind of an eagerness. It's an excitement. Uh, it's an anticipation. You know, uh, and a very good um, way to, to, to understand it. Uh, another uh, distinction I want to make because I want to I want to uh, honor everybody, uh, all of us believers right now. Uh, uh, our faith is is greater than uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Peter and Paul. We have greater faith in them. Every one of them got to see. And touch and eat with Jesus after the resurrection, you know, not everyone, but they all, they all got proof and we don't have the proof except believing the account in the scriptures. And therefore they didn't really have faith. Maybe they, they had faith before the resurrection. If there's someone that believed that uh, he's going to be raised or his, he is the promised one. Uh, and then maybe they lost their faith when he was killed on the cross and they're all afraid and forgot then me hey didn't he even think hey there's going to be a resurrection don't worry uh, we don't see that in the scriptures uh, so i believe that perhaps they lost their faith and then the resurrection is what finally proved it to them but the point i'm making is uh we have not had this proof given to us and so i don't think paul had faith he had knowledge experience he had proof it was it was actually proven to him and and uh and uh but we have faith we have not seen and touched him and yet we believe and so there's something really special about that and uh so i would say dan a man i saw a little comment you made in there that oh renee sometimes i have doubts and what's going on and why and you explain that and help me and yeah but uh um that's the whole point of what we're saying here is that uh, um, I do believe that, as I just illustrated, that the, the, the apostles all, I believe, lost their faith after Jesus was crucified. And, and the scriptures do tell us that uh, if we have no faith, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. And he is referring to Jesus. So, Dan, I believe if your faith wanes, uh, one, you, 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 I hope you understand that the gospel is the good news that eternal life has been guaranteed to you. Nothing can change that. If you understood that at any point, then it's, it's, it's settled and it's, it's, it's a reality for you. And, and the, the, the guarantee of eternal life applies to you. Um, and, but if sometime you, some doubt ever comes in because for whatever reason, uh, it doesn't change your standing before God, but it could you could you could agonize over it. But you need to remind yourself of why, why you believed in the first place, perhaps. But uh, I, I want you to know that the Bible says uh, Jesus promised over and over again, we get eternal life when we believe in him. And the Bible says God cannot lie. God cannot break a promise. And it even says, Dan, even if you have no faith, if your faith wanes, Jesus will remain faithful to you. He, no one can pluck you out of his hand. Sister? Yeah, uh, I, a verse just popped up when, uh, in my mind when uh, Jason was talking about, you know, how the hope is a sure hope. It's just based on God's promises. The verse came up, that it, which lordship people also take out of context. But to me, it's wonderful. It's our salvation is nearer than when we first believe people think that means see you don't have full salvation yet they don't get it what he's talking about is the saving of the body the fullness of our salvation which means jesus returning and giving us our glorified bodies so that is a sure hope see our salvation is nearer than when we first believed Ooh. when we first believed our spirit was already redeemed right we have been redeemed we've been purchased but it talks about that we're sealed by the holy spirit until the day of redemption so it's kind of like when you go to a pawn shop and you put the money down but you haven't picked up the item yet so jesus paid for us it's a done deal 
but this body hasn't been redeemed yet. So our salvation is nearer than when we first believed, meaning the salvation of the body. So that is a sure hope of our glorified body. So I just wanted to clarify that, that the salvation is nearer than when we first believed. We already are saved as far as eternally, positionally, but the salvation of our bodies, being given our glorified bodies to be just like Jesus is nearer because his coming is nearer now than when it was when we first believed. So that is a sure hope that we have. Did that make sense? Yeah. Amen. Yeah, it, it does, but I, I need to address uh, Chase here in the chat room. Uh, Luke's blo he says, I blocked him, I blocked him. I would never block you, Chase, or anybody else uh, if, you're not, if you're not misbehaving. But you're doing the same thing right now that you always do every single time from the very first time I ever encountered you. The very first time you stood out to me because what you need is to be the center of attention. This program tonight is not about Chase. The chat room, the conversation is not about Chase. And I don't care if you have 300 accounts, you know, uh, I'll get rid of one, one at a time if you continue to need to be the center of attention. So, so participate in the chat room right now. Stay on subject that we're talking about and, and don't try to get the chat room all about Chase. Okay? Stop being so self-centered. All right. Uh, now let me uh, let me read that in the Amplified, and then uh, we'll, we'll continue on here. Uh, verse twenty-four in the Amplified says, "For in this hope we were saved by faith." But hope, the object of which is seen, is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait eagerly for it with patience and composure. I like that. That last portion is kind of what you were saying, Brother Cripps, the way it's expressing it there. Um, we wait eagerly. That's what I was getting from your original comment there. It's an eagerness. It's an anticipation. It's a hopeful, uh, you know, I can't, I'm looking forward to it uh, when you're using your example about looking forward to the weekend. Uh, okay. Anything else before I go to the next verse, guys? Okay, we'll move on to the next verse then. Okay, next verse in the KJV 25 says, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? Uh, all right, Brother Cripps, why don't you go first this time? Sure. So he's he's doing what Paul does best. He's just double down on the point. He's doubling down on it. Uh, so if we hope for that, which we don't see, I'm, I'm putting it in my own words. So if we hope for that, which we don't see, he's making a statement. This is not a question. Notice what, as you always point out, punctu punctuation. This isn't a question. This is a statement. Then we with patience wait for it. He's telling us that we need to wait for that with patience. We have the hope. We don't see it but we wait for it with patience. Um, and, that, and, and that's something that's beneficial for all of us to learn how to live in that patience. Um, to use the same analogy, when I was a kid, that was the problem was that on Monday, when they tell me I'm doing something on the weekend, um, I, I, <laughs> I had to learn patience. I wanted that right now on Monday. I didn't wanna go through a week of school and uh, have to wait for something. But the more and more that happened, the more and more I learned patience. And that's all he's saying here is that we wait, uh, we wait for that with patience. So he's just, he's just kind of, it's a capper sentence for verse 24, in my opinion. All right. Renee, verse 25. Yeah, I don't really have anything to add for it. He's just saying that we're just patiently waiting for the hope, the promise that God has given us. That's all. Okay, let me see how it's stated in the Amplified. Uh, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait eagerly for it with patience and composure. Uh, oh, There's yeah. that word. No, There's yeah, that. yeah, eagerly. Eagerly, yep. Yeah, eagerly. Uh, that's the, uh, I must have read that in the in the Amplified uh, originally. That's why you, did, you did, you did. You, you tagged it on there because it, yeah. it made sense to do that. But, right. you know. <laughs> I'm confusing myself here. So let's go to the next verse. 
uh, the next verse is uh, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Renee, you probably have something to say about that. Yeah, um, I do. I want to break it a little bit down here. Okay, it says, likewise, the Spirit, capital S, that's the Holy Spirit, also help with our infirmities. Now, our infirmities are not just sicknesses. It's also the weaknesses of our flesh. It's it's doubt. It's um, our impatience. Uh, so the Holy Spirit prays for us that our spirits be strengthened. See, we don't even know what we should pray for. You know, and sometimes I will ask, I'll say, Holy Spirit, please pray for me because I don't even know what I should be praying for right now. Uh, I don't know what God's will is in this situation, but pray for me to have the spiritual strength to handle it uh, and so forth. Because our infirmities don't just mean sicknesses. It means weaknesses. And we know that we're weak through the flesh. So it says, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. So we don't even know what areas we lack to even ask God to pray for them. I'm not even aware of my own weaknesses uh, that I need to pray for. I have to rely upon the Holy Spirit to pray for me for those things. And it says, but the capital S spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings, which cannot be uttered. So he goes to the father and makes intercession. See, the, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ. He will always point to Christ. He is the seed of Christ. And so since Jesus is the mediator and makes intercession for us, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings. And I, I find it interesting. A lot of these prophets on YouTube and then the Holy Spirit revealed that we, we don't even know how to verbalize what the Holy Spirit is saying half the time, you know, and there's so much false teaching being done in the name of the Holy Spirit or of the father. And I find it interesting because I'm going out on a limb here, but the Holy Spirit will always point to Jesus. And one of these things I see about the father and the Holy Spirit, they never talk about Jesus and he's the name above all names. And he's the one the spirit will always point to. So here it's just telling us that in our spiritual weakness, because uh, I think the context here is he's talking about the hope. He's talking about the hope we have not seen. And so we're waiting patiently for that, right? And so the infirmity here, I believe, is our weakness in our faith, our impatience, and things that uh, need to be strengthened spiritually, not just like physically, like sicknesses and physical needs and stuff, but more of the spiritual things that we require that we don't even know that we require. So the Holy Spirit prays for us. I believe that's that's what he's saying. He makes intercession for us because we can't do it. We don't even know that we need it. Yeah. Wow. Oh, I'm thankful for that. Uh, Brother Cripps? Yeah. First of all, Renee, you nailed that. I agree with you 100% on your description of infirmities. It is not just physical things. It, it, this whole verse is about the, the spiritual part. Um, and the Spirit is used twice, both capital letters. That is absolutely the Holy Spirit. And uh, this this verse itself, it's interesting that the Holy Spirit is a comforter. And this verse, which talking about the Holy Spirit, is comforting to me. And this verse itself, twenty six, is is taken out of context so much. And I, I I won't go I won't go there. But there's a lot of people that use this verse to build up their their uh, doctrine and say that it's something that it's not. What it is, is our our spirit, while we're walking around in this flesh, we don't have a full understanding of ourselves. God knows us completely, but we don't know ourselves completely. We don't. And it's we're not going to know ourselves until uh, until we're complete, until we do have that uh, eternal body. And even then we have eternity to get to know God more, to get to know each other more and get to know ourselves more. Uh, but the the spirit is there. There's a there's a disconnect between our spirit man and our flesh man. Absolutely, one hundred percent. So when we're praying, how many times have you been on your knees before God and and you're 
your uh, spirit is so locked up and you're upset about, well, let me just speak for myself. There have been times when I've, I've gone through a real difficult time and sometimes I just weep before God. While I'm weeping, the Holy Spirit is is helping me because I can't express it. He's he's acting as intercessor and comforter at the same time, and he does share. Uh, he he translates rather everything that we're not able to share in that moment because we're on our knees and we're crying and we're wailing before God. He knows what we're crying about. The Holy Spirit knows everything about us. He knows us better than we know ourselves, and he's translating that. He's intercessing for us with the Father. I loved, Renee, that you you, you said that, and, and this is right out of Scripture, that the, uh, the Holy Spirit always points to Jesus, and that is so true. So when we're going through whatever problems or infirmities or whatever, whatever's plaguing us, whether it's doubt or whether it's, uh, you know, we're not sure that we're saved anymore, whatever the case may be, the Holy Spirit, when we have him inside us, is helping us, helping build that up in us. And I would also uh, add it to verse 24 and 25 and talking about hope. The, these This inter intercession that we get with the Holy Spirit, as we continue to grow, it gets easier and easier to pray. It, at least it does for me. But I know that the comfort comes from knowing that if, if I'm in a position where I don't even know what I need to pray for, that the Holy Spirit does that for me. And uh, that's just, i it's so comforting to me. So thanks, appreciate it. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is comforting. And you know, a lot of people have been commenting about how great this verse is, how much this verse means to, to them. It, it, to know that even when we don't know what to pray, that, that uh, uh, the Spirit, is already making intercession for us and, and uh, because the spirit knows our needs even more than we know our needs. And on one hand, I mean, it's very comforting, but you know, I always like, to, I'm sorry. I, 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 I tend to bring up things that as possible objections and, and you know, what about this then? Uh, but I could see how a person could say, well, what's the need for prayer? Uh, why do we even need to pray that if the Spirit's interceding for us all the time anyway? And uh, it's not necessary for us to pray. The Spirit's praying or interceding for us on our behalf better than we could on our own. Renee? I, I'm sorry. I, I heard what you were saying, but what was the question? Well, question was, what if someone says, well, what, why do we even need to pray? The Spirit's going to inter oh, intercede on my behalf what? anyway. The Spirit what? knows my needs more better than I do. It's for fellowship. We want to speak to our Father. Plus, the more you pray, the better you hear from God, the better He shows you things in Scripture. Uh, I mean, of course, just because you don't always get an answer from your dad, do you never call him again? You know, it's like, but but the Holy Spirit prays in ways we can't. But the ways we can pray, we should pray. I mean, we're told by Jesus himself to pray and to ask for what we need in his name. That's a command to pray. So we still should pray just because there's some things that we can't pray for efficiently doesn't mean we don't pray at all. All right, Brother Kipps, you get the point, and uh, Renee answered it. Give me your thoughts on that, and, and then I want to add another wrinkle to it. Yeah, so so first of all, it is what Renee said. It is for the relationship. I like what she said. We have the Father. We don't we call him once and don't call him again. That was beautiful. Yeah, well, he wants relationship with us. That's one reason. The other thing is it's for us. Again, the reason why Paul's using this is because he's talking about hope. He's He's building up this idea of hope. So when we're in that when we're in that place and we're on our knees and we're praying and there's also the intercession, then it's building our hope to pray. Yeah. So uh, it, it, he doesn't want us to just know that the Holy Spirit is praying for us and, and we don't have to pray. The more we pray and we have that relationship, the more hope builds in us uh, by use of the Holy Spirit. He confirms things for us. He works with us on a daily basis. He renews our mind. Uh, that's the transformation that I always talk about. And that happens by by praying, but as which we've discussed is 
is just talking to him. It's just having a relationship with him. It continues to build our hope. It is very much for us as well. Uh, it's multi-purpose, but it is for us. It grows us, it changes us, it transforms us, and it builds our hope. Hey, Jason and Luke, I just wanted to add in the in the chat room, Sonic Grace, he just said something funny, but so true. He said, you can't have a relationship if you don't talk to somebody. <laughs> You know, you got to talk to somebody if you're in a relationship with them. Yeah, uh, I've made that point in some old videos that uh, imagine that uh, in a marriage, um, you never spoke to them, the other person. I mean, how, how would that affect the relationship? And another example is what if every time you spoke to them, you had a, let's say, a paragraph written down and every day you just you know, recite that same paragraph to them every day of their life, the same day. Say, <laughs> the vain repetitious prayer, the vain. Yeah, that, that's not the kind of, kind of communication I'm looking for there. You're just repeating yourself over and over again. It's mindless uh, gibberish, uh, uh, mindless, what is it called? Uh, um, uh, what, what did Jesus call it? Uh, the, the, the type of repetitious pair, repetitious what? Vain, repetitions. vain repetitions. Vain repetitions. Imagine talking to your spouse and you just repeat the same five sentences every single morning to them. And, and uh, it's vain repetitions. Come on. We have a marriage. Can you, we talk a little bit? <laughs> Another thing about this prayer, uh, and for those people in the congregation that struggle with this kind of a thing, I want you to know you're not alone. Uh, I, this is the way my, my mind works sometimes. And it, I end up thinking, maybe I think too much. But I'm thinking, as we're discussing this, uh, okay, so maybe the best prayer is, Lord, you know all my needs. You know um, you know, uh, 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 better than me. Let me see, how does it say here? Uh, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession. So uh, you know better than me my needs, so you just take care of it all. And yet, that's kind of risky for me uh, because it's it's kind of like i started off praying many years ago uh lord i have a character flaw i'm a, i'm impatient i lose my patience so lord help me get more patience that prayer didn't last that long because it dawned on me one day that if i'm asking for patience that i'm going to be re required to be put in situations that test and, 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 and create patience. You have to go through trying situations that are that would make you impatient to develop patience. And I thought, oh, I don't want that. I'd rather not have my patience get better if I have to endure, go through some struggling to get it. And it's the same kind of a thing. If, if you just turn it over to God and say, God, I know the spirit knows better than me. So you just, you just take over and, uh, you know, well, gee, what if God knows better than you and, he, and his plan is totally different than what you want? I mean, you're nice and comfortable. You don't want the boat rocked. And yet God has some, something else in mind. And you're, now you're saying, your will be done, Lord. Like, Thy will be done in my life. Do, you, do I really? Uh-oh. Do I really want God's will done in my life? Maybe I'll get uprooted. Maybe that my, my life will have to be totally turned around and flipped over uh, to, to actually do God's will. Do you have any of those thoughts? Or am I just like a scared, paranoid, schizophrenic? Brother Cripps, you go first this time if you, if you followed me. Hey, you guys, I just wanted to say you were talking about that vain repetitious prayer. In Matthew 6, 7, Jesus makes sure to say that those kind of prayers are what the pagans do so if you look at the catholics with their buddhist eastern prayer beads and their constant vain repetitious prayers that stems from overt flat out babylonian paganism i just wanted to confirm that yeah and, it, and, it, and it's what the catholics do too they they say that they say that they say their prayers over and over again and they repeat the same things constantly amen um and, and and that's what religions do okay that's the difference between the relationship we have with god 
and the and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and Him working with us and transforming us by the daily renewing of our mind every day, walking with Him. Uh, we're always we're always saying new things. We're learning new things. We're growing as we stay connected to the vine. We're constantly growing. We don't have to say the same thing again and again. It's no problem to say the Lord's Prayer. There, it, it's a it's a pattern that Jesus put in the Bible that would disciples asked how we pray, and so it's a pattern that's given to us. But we fill in our own things. It's just you know give glory to God at the beginning. You know pray for our daily needs, et cetera, et cetera. That there's there's no problem with that. But the vain, the vain repetitions part, that's a good point, uh, Renee, and that's that's what religions do. Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed art thou among women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, and you say it again and again and again. And it's and in fact, um, you know, you come in and you uh, give your confession, and then they tell you how many Hail Marys you need to say and how many whatevers. Like it's a um, punishment, like it's a punishment to pray. But also, Muslims... Hindus, Buddhists, they call them mantras. Yep. They'll repeat over and over again these mantras. And then the Muslims pray five times a day based on the sh the movement of the sun. <laughs> then they do their Hajj seven times for the five moving planets and the sun and the moon. Yes. They do that to worship the hosts of heaven. They don't realize it. It's all Babylonian. And they yep. pray little parts of their Quran or little parts of the Mahabharata for the Hindus or Buddhist mantras in Catholic uh, uh, prayer beads. It's all the same. Our faith should look nothing like any of those Babylonian religions at Amen. all. Amen. So, uh, Brother Cripps, uh, the point you made, I'm in agreement with it, but I would, um, I would change one word uh, and think that there's a better way to say it. And you called the Lord's Prayer a pattern to follow. Uh, I would think rather than a pattern, uh, Jesus gave us an example of how to pray or a model of how to pray, but not as a pattern that we, we repeat these things. I, I think a pattern would be um, that it's, um, would, would, would support the Roman Catholics idea of uh, this is the pattern you repeat it over and over again. But I, uh, uh, all right, let's, let's, let me read that in the Amplified. Um, let me see. Which verse was that? Yeah, that was still 26. Uh, and the Amplified 26 says, um, in the same way the Spirit comes to us and helps us in our weakness, we do not know what prayer to offer or how to offer it as we should, but the Spirit himself knows our need at the right time, intercedes on our behalf with sighs and groanings too deep for words. What do you think of that uh, way of expressing it? I love the too deep for words part. I mean, that 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 brings it home too deep for words. A again, it's the idea that we don't know ourselves fully. I, I want to just give a brief example. Do you know that we, we cannot actually uh, see ourselves fully? When you look in a mirror, you're, you're not seeing yourselves as other people see you. There's no way, even looking at a video, you're not able to see yourself exactly as other people are able to see you. The same way with the way that we sound. When we hear our own voices for the first time on a recording, what's the thing that people always say? Do I really sound like that? You're not able to hear yourself or know yourself fully, but the Holy Spirit is. God knows you better than you know yourself. And so in, in, this, in this way, I mean, that's a great way to put it in the Amplified. I, th I think that, you know, I mean, these deep, these deep things that we don't even understand about ourselves, the Holy Spirit knows us because he, well, he's God and he has a full understanding of us. And I can't wait to get to verse seven because this tied the verse 27, because this, this explains a lot of it too, even, even further. So. Okay. Uh, let's do 27 and 28 together. It says, uh, and he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called 
according to his purpose. Maybe 28 should have been separated because there's an awful lot of theology in verse 28. So <laughs> go ahead, brother. Or, uh, Renee, your, your turn. Yeah, I was just going to say, man, we're going to get into killing Calvinism in a minute. Um, <clears throat> I think the verse here, it just says, He that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the capital S spirit, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. I think that's just saying, it's kind of uh, explaining the verse above, that the Holy Spirit prays for us in ways we can't even, like you said, in word, in ways we can't even speak through words. It's groanings that can't even be uttered. There's a communication going on with the Father through the Holy Spirit that we can't even fathom in language. I think it's something that can't even be put into language. The Holy Spirit is communicating something so deep and spiritual to the Father because he's searching our hearts and he knows the mind of the Spirit because the he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So not only does he know our hearts, he knows the heart and the mind of God and his will so that he makes it all work so that the prayers are perfect, which is a way that we, we can't even do. And I don't think there's a way we can even put it in language, as it says in the prior verse, that it's something deep. Remember, it says those that worship him will worship him in spirit. And in truth, and one of the ways we worship God, the only way, is through receiving his son's sacrifice. So that's how we worship him in truth. We're coming through the son. And here the spirit is working along with the will of the father uh, for our prayer, for, for us to be prayed for and to have our prayers answered. That's what it seems like he's saying there. Let me jump in. Uh, the... Uh we're moving on, but I, I got to go back to this uh, with groanings, which cannot be uttered because uh, I'm thinking that the, uh, why are the, why can it not be uttered? Uh, I, I think it's, it's different than when Paul says he was told things by God that cannot be said, that it has to be kept secret. And uh, I, that is, hey, I can't give you this information yet. But in this case, it cannot be uttered. Is not saying you're not allowed to say it. It's saying that it can't be expressed in words. It's too deep for words. There are no words to express this. Um, that's what I would think. But, uh, okay, Brother Cripps, uh, verse uh, uh, 27. Yes, absolutely. So I, I'm pretty excited about this because here's the word at the beginning that, that Paul chose to use, or at least the translation, the English translation here is searcheth. And he that searcheth the hearts. Uh, there's another verse, I don't know exactly where it's found, but it, he holds the reins. He he knows us. He, um, he determines our fruits. He determines our intent, all the intents of our heart. He has a full understanding of them. And again, I love that Paul does this. I uh, the, the more and more we go through Romans, the more and more I, I think about uh, what the kind of things and doctrines and things that were going on at that time that he must have fought against and the fact that we still fight against the same things now. The reason why all these verses have to be explained explained again and again and again and why he keeps repeating himself, it seems like he's just so repetitive, is because we're still struggling. We still have people that, that don't get this. I mean, this is so plain to me, and I do agree that 27, uh, 27 explains 26. It, 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 it brings it home. So he searches the hearts, know, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Yep. And uh, because he maketh intercession for the saints. And here's the last part I wanted to highlight, the will of God. How often does it say in Scripture to give us ideas of what to pray for? When we pray for wisdom, we know that he's going give it, to give it to us liberally. So I pray for wisdom all the time because that's something that I want. So certainly when we pray knowingly for something that, that God wants, all, we have uh, a, a better chance and almost an assurity that he's going to give that to us. So if it's something that we're not even aware of because it's deep, 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 deep inside us, and the Holy Spirit knows that, he knows our spirit, he knows everything about us. Again, I keep repeating that same thing. We, we don't know everything about ourselves yet. We're not going to. It's because we don't have the full understanding of ourselves. But the Spirit does. 
And so when we have these groanings, which cannot be uttered in verse 26, 27, he searches the hearts. No, he that searches the hearts knoweth the mind of the spirit, spirit of God, because he maketh intercession for the saints. That's us. That's all of us that, that have believed on him according to the will of God, the perfect will of God. And then I, you know, I'm going back up to 24 again. This also builds hope. This is this is for Dan. It's on that same. Well, it's for all of us. But it, it, he he's making the point here exactly that fits the question. You know, about anything that we deal with, doubt or whatever, whatever it is that we are struggling with, um, the relationship with God and the praying, and you know that the Spirit is going to bat for you and everything, even if it's something that you don't have a full understanding of. He understands it. And and the more the the closer you get to him, the more you more uh, the the more you stay uh, connected to the vine and connected to him. That Holy Spirit is going to continue to work with you on that and build your hope and give you give you more understanding as time goes on. But you can be assured there's that comfort again. You can be assured that even if it's something deep 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 inside you that you don't have full understanding of, he's going to keep working that. He's going to keep talking to the Father about that on your behalf, and it gets easier and easier. Uh, if we finish this uh, chapter tonight, then uh, next week we'll begin uh, chapter 9. And I've done a lot of preparation for chapter 9 because it's the foundation of the er heretical teachings of Calvin. Uh, but already we have a couple of things we're now that are just like the very beginnings of some of these Calvinistic errors. And, and, and uh, the question of according to the will of God is a very important thing to understand. When a Calvinist uh, reads scripture, he's reading it with the Calvinistic philosophy in mind and trying to, in everything he can, he's trying to uh, understand through that lens. Uh, so uh, some people would take this verse and say, see, everything is the will of God and man does not have a free will. That's the, that's the difference between Calvinism and, uh, you know, uh, God's, God's, real sovereignty what do you call that eisegesis when they put their preconceived notions yeah. in okay yeah eisegesis is putting in your idea into the scriptures exegesis is reading the scriptures and letting the scriptures tell you plainly what it means and just accepting it rather than than trying to trying to twist it according to your philosophy that you're bringing into it so it's putting into the scriptures or just accepting what the scriptures say for what it really means and, but here, when it says according to the will of God, um, it brings up the question of uh, sovereignty. By the way, um, this might su surprise people. Uh, I imagine that many people here have not studied Calvinism that much, uh, if at all, uh, and don't understand the, the seriousness of this uh, heresy. But um, the, the word sovereignty is not in the Bible. Did you hear that? I'm saying in the KJV, just like in the KJV, we don't find the term repent of your sins. That term is not in the KJV. The word sovereignty, even sovereign, is not in the KJV. Now, the concept we can find, just like the word trinity is not in the KJV, but the concept is there. But the concept of sovereignty in the Bible that we need to understand is that God is omnipotent. God can do ever anything he wants to do. Anything that can be done, if God wants to do it, he can do it. But uh, the what I would call hyper-sovereignty is taking the idea that God is able to do everything to an extreme position and saying God exercises that ability and controls everything. In other words, every thought, word, and deed of man and the devil and the angels and everybody, everything, thought, word, and deed, God is in controlling it. We don't have any free thoughts or free actions, or we're basically mindless puppets or little, little uh, robots that God's programming and making do everything. That is the sovereignty of Calvinism. That's what I will call hyper sovereignty. But the idea of God being sovereign, and it's just like you have a king of a country is called a sovereign, uh, but he, he, he is sovereign in that he, had, he can do what he wants in his kingdom. He's the boss. 
but he's not actually controlling every person in the kingdom, everything they think and do. You know, it's the same thing with God. He can intercede and, and do it and take control whenever he wants to, but he allows us to operate freely based upon our own decisions and free will. Because only with free will can there be a love relationship between man and God. And without free will, it's impossible to have a love relationship. So that's kind of the the beginnings of what we'll be getting into uh, next chapter uh, as we talk about, uh, uh, you know, the that's the, that's the main chapter of the Bible for Calvinism, chapter 9. So here what says, according to the will of God, that the, don't take that to mean that God is going to control it all, but God does have a will, he, but he does not exercise his will all the time. It's like when it says that, uh, did, do not think that God is, is, is slack in his promises. No, he's long-suffering, he's patient, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, so it's saying that uh, uh, God is uh, being patient with us. Uh, he's a, um, He doesn't desire that any should perish. And yet we know from uh, tons of scripture, there are people who will perish. So God is not imposing that desire on us. It is what he wants. His heart is, I want everybody to come to the belief in Jesus and get eternal life, but he's not imposing on everybody. So um, there's a difference between the, the will of God and the desires of God and, and thinking then that that will play out. God will get his will. God will get his desire every time. No, he doesn't enforce his desires on us because that would mean that we don't have any free will and therefore we can't have a love relationship. Uh, all right, before I go to the next verse, any response to that? Okay, the next, uh, let me read that in the Amplified before we go on. Um, and, and we know with great confidence that God, who is deeply concerned about us, causes all things to work together as a plan for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his plan and purpose. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, damn, I did the same thing again. I read it in the, uh, I meant to read that 27 in the KJ, in the Amplified. Let me back up. Verse 27 in the Amplified. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because the spirit intercedes before God on behalf of God's people in accordance with God's will. So no great uh, revelation from the Amplified on verse 27, but so on in 28. So Rene, verse 28, KJV, and we know that all things work together for good to the, them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Rene? <coughs> yeah, I saw we're gonna get into a little Calvinism and I'm glad because each verse broken down explains it so well. Uh, the next one is, explains some of this, but all right. Somebody just asked me a second ago. So God does make all things happen, right? Nope, nope, nope. God sees the end from the beginning. Now his overall purpose will always be served, but he doesn't cause all these bad things to happen that happen in this world. However, it says he will use them for the good of those who love him. So what people mean for evil against us or what the enemy means as evil against us, God will flip that script and make it work in our favor somehow, helping us grow spiritually or to benefit us in some way. Just like Joseph, his brothers sold him into slavery and they meant it for evil. But Joseph said God used it for good because he saved the lives of millions of people by having Joseph be in prison at the exact time that a dream needed to be interpreted. Then Pharaoh had his dream interpreted and put him as the second most powerful man in all the world, the civilized world, saving millions of people's lives, including that of his family, which became Israel. So. Although God didn't cause those evil things to happen, he used them 
for the good of those who love him. And that is what that means. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Now, I want to remind everybody we're not saved because we love God. We're saved because he first loved us. But here he's talking about service. So he says to them who are called according to his purpose. And now every saved per person is called according to God's purpose. We still have free will whether we're going to walk in that purpose. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't have a purpose for it just because we don't walk in it. But because we're saved and we belong to God, Paul is constantly reminded us we're bought with a price. We belong to God. We are debtors to Christ, not ourselves. And so he tries to keep us on the path of being and walking in God's purpose. So he will use all things, including the bad, meant for evil against us, to us that are called according to his purpose. I just want to mention we're not called, we're not, all right, I won't get into that till the next verse, but that that's all this verse says to me. All right, very well done, sister. Uh, I'm restraining myself, but I want, Brother Cripps, go ahead. Okay, um, 28, I love this verse, and I, I am uh, on the, I, I'm right in the process right now of living this verse out, the promise that he gives us here. So first, I want to make the point, and I've said this before, but when when uh, we see this word in Scripture, all, and I always say, what does all mean? All means all. That's all all means. Uh, it's kind of quippy, but it's absolutely true. So when he says all, he means all. So he says, and this is what a great promise this is. And we know he's he's saying to everyone that he's speaking to as if they already have knowledge of this. And we know that all things, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are uh, who are the, uh, the called according to his purpose. Um, this for me, okay, so for an example, I, I went through a divorce. Uh, it was finalized in 2012, but it started in 2011. It was not my choice. I didn't uh, plan on going through the divorce. God didn't make my uh, ex-wife decide that she was going to going to um, to leave the marriage. Uh, it's something that happened to me. It was not a choice that I made. God didn't make it happen. But what God did was, uh, and I didn't realize at the time. In fact, at the time, I was on my knees saying, "Why would Why would you allow this to happen? Why? I, this is something that I've wanted my whole life. It's something I pray to you for. I prayed." that you uh, helped me find the woman that would always uh, be with me and stay with me and have that marriage commitment that is a shadow of our relationship with you. I wanted to live a biblical marriage, and I uh, uh, read books, and I studied, and I did all this, all these things. Why are you allowing this to happen? And back then, I didn't understand why you allowed it to happen, but I believe this verse. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I didn't see at that time how I was going to do it. How's God going to work out a divorce? Such a devastating thing. It, 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 you know, it's all the shame that comes with it and all the failure and all the feelings that come out of that for me. But now, after all these years, I understand that he did it for so many. Re he allowed that thing to happen and he changed it from something that was meant for bad into something that was good. He brought me closer to him. He showed me that during the one of the worst times of my life, one of the most down times of my life, he showed me his presence in a real way, uh, more than he'd ever had to up until that point. Up until that point when I experienced that, I, I really honestly in many ways took for granted the the his position in my life. I mean, I didn't take for granted what he did for me, but I took for granted his being present with me in all things. But now, all these years later, when I look back at that experience and I look back at who I was back then, and I look at all the blessings that he's given me as a result of having gone through that, how uh, he's given me understanding when I see a brother or sister going through the very, very same thing, and I'm able to walk alongside them and point, point out this very idea, uh, idea to them that even though it doesn't seem like it then, I mean, uh, Brother Luke was talking about Joseph. That's a perfect example. I'm sure when Joseph, Joseph was being thrown into a pit by his brothers, he wasn't saying, oh, I know that God's going to use this for my good. I know that he's going to make it all work out in the end. 
how did it work out for him? He was second only to the Pharaoh in the land of Egypt. Yeah, I would say that worked out pretty good for him, even though it didn't start out well. He was in prison. How did that work out for him? Well, it worked out pretty good. God made it work out. Yeah, so uh, this is a this is a promising verse for everyone. Whatever anyone's going through in your life right now, keep remembering this, that God's going to turn it around for you. And he, he proves this to us so many times in our lives. If we believe on him, he, we know that whatever we're going through uh, in our lives, even if we're, even if we die, I mean, even if, even if the, the natural result of whatever we're going through ends up being death, we know and can believe that God is on the other side of that and that we have eternal life through him. And I would say that works out pretty good. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you for giving me credit for uh, the Joseph account, but uh, uh, Rene uh, brought that up as, as a uh, example of the point that we we're discussing. And oh, I, sorry about that. <laughs> I, I, but you saw me applauding it. I was applauding. <laughs> sorry Rene, about that. <laughs> Rene pulled that up, and I'm saying, yeah, that's a perfect uh, example of what we're talking about there. But um, okay, the. Um, Several things about this verse. Um, one is, I would probably end everything you everybody said about this and the verse itself, and put on the word eventually. <laughs> uh huh. Uh, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Eventually. Not every time, and if it happens in our life, that everything works out for the good. Right now, sometimes years later, as you said, you, you gave an example, Brother Cripps. It, you didn't think it was working out for your good right then, but later on, you saw that it was for, for good. And sometimes I think when we say eventually, it might not be until uh, you know the, uh, it, we get into eternity that it actually works out for our good. Amen. Eventually, Amen. everything works out for our good to those who uh, love God. Uh, and then the other thing is, uh, to them who are called according to his purpose, uh, we have to keep in mind that this first part of that verse is talking about a particular group of people. And it says it's a group of people that loves God and that are called according to God's purpose. And so, uh, of course, God is calling everybody to salvation. Hey, everybody, here's a free gift, eternal life. Everybody listen, and everybody can have it. He's calling out to everybody to, to, to tell the good news about the gift that's available and offered to everyone. But um, for in other ways, people are called for a specific purpose. These are what we call elect. The elect should not be understood as a group of people who are believers in Christ. The elect should be understood as a group of people or any person that is um, um, elected by God or chosen by God for a particular purpose like Jonah. Jonah was elected by God to do the thing that he was uh, set to do. And uh, Israel was elect because God elected them to be the nation, to give the genealogy, to bring the um, Messiah into the world. Uh, so... Um, the idea of being called and elect and chosen, all these things, we don't, we don't, should not automatically think that word applies to someone being a believer. It could be that for the purpose of a, a work that God has wants you to do. Um, okay, now let's go to um, verse 29. Hey, Renee, here it is. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. I'm going to read the next verse too. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Okay. So this word predestinate and predestination, uh, 
Renee, I'd like you to go first, but I, I will say to everybody first that I made a video that's uh, two minutes long or three minutes long about two months ago. Brother Leah Larson sent me a video and he said, you got to see this. And after watching the video about predestination, I had to make a video publicly recanting my previous position because I always interpreted the verses about predestination and foreknowledge to be understood that um, God knows the future. He's not controlling it and making it happen. We have free will, but God knows the beginning for the end. And because of his foreknowledge, it's predestined. It's destiny because God knows that knows the outcome. That's how I've always understood and taught the verses on predestination. But Brother Leo sent me a, a video from a teaching of someone. Uh, you can find it on my channel and watch the entire full video because this brother teaches this far better than I'm going to be able to explain it now. That's why I made a three minute video saying, watch this video. I put the link in the description. Watch this video and see why I changed my mind about predestination. Uh, so, Sister Renee, um, I'll leave it, let you talk about it now. Uh, go ahead. Okay. It's it's difficult because, because I do know that God knows the end from the beginning, but I also know, because we take the full counsel of God, that he's not willing any should perish. Jesus said he would call, he would draw all men unto himself and that he died for the whole world, okay? So that puts aside Calvin's assumption that Jesus only died for the elect, as in God elected or chose certain people to be saved and certain people to be lost. I do not believe that anyone will be able to stand before God and say, I was one of the ones that you chose not to believe and therefore I'm not guilty. And I also, I don't care how they justify it. Well, nobody deserves salvation. So even if some are saved, it's his mercy. No, I'm not buying that. Okay. I believe that God is good, that Jesus died for the whole world. That world means world, not special people. Okay. I think in our limited human understanding of time space, it's difficult to explain with God being in eternity, just like Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It says the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So that's hard for us to understand. With that being in mind, I believe that the predestination is that all saved people are predestined to be conformed in the image of Jesus. That's the predestination. They were not predestined to be saved. They were predestined to be made in the likeness and the image of Jesus. That's why it says, as he is, so are we in this world. So he's talking about the saved people and what he's done for them, I believe is what's going on here. He said, for whom he did for no. So I believe that it says uh, the elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, I believe he did foreknow us because he foreknew his son and he foreknew who would be in his son. Okay, so he did know us. From whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be saved. No, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. One day we'll have a glorified body. Our spirits are technically without sin. They're perfected. We have God's righteousness, but one day we'll have a glorified body. And it says that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay. So he is the first risen from the dead in his glorified body, but he is the first among many brethren that will be risen unto glory. OK, so he goes on to explain it. Moreover, whom he did predestinate to be conformed in the image of his son. Then he also called. We are called for a purpose. It tells us that. And whom he called them, he also justified. That means declared righteous. By the way, it says that he will he calls all men. 
Okay. Everyone, not everyone answers that call. Okay. I believe some of this is in our hands. I think that we, in the hardness of our hearts, can reject it or we can receive it. Some people don't. Some people believe that he just picks us. Some people are picked to believe. Some people aren't. I do not believe that. And I don't believe it because based on other scriptures that say, whosoever will come drink of the water freely. So it has something to do with our being willing to do that. Now, when it said it's not for him that will it or for him that runneth, that means it's not a person's efforts that makes it happen. That's all that means. All right. Then he also called and whom he called, them he also justified, declared righteous, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So this whole second section here, uh, verse 30, seems to be a breakdown of, of 29, which says he also did predestinate to be conformed in the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Then it explains the process of being conformed in the image of his son. They're called, they're justified, they're uh, uh, predestined to be conformed in the image of his son. It says that first, and then he glorified him. So I think that 30 is a, is a breakdown of the predestination of being conformed in the image of Jesus. I think that's what 30 is explaining there. Yeah, I'm happy to hear you say that because I think you've got it right. And I will say that it took me 32 years to be corrected. And because I had a, I, I understood it incorrectly. I was teaching it incorrectly. And I think that way you expressed it is the right way to do it. That uh, we are destined, if when we are a believer, every believer is predestined to be conformed to the image of God. Hey, uh, Brother Cripps, if, if there's nothing that can change it, you're going to be conformed to the image of Christ. It's destiny. Amen. Thanks for that every promise. Every believer, every believer is destiny. It's predestined. That's what's predestined. Actually, the video that I watched on this, it uh, it goes into much more detail for probably thirty minutes or an hour, and it talk and it and it, I think there's four things that they point out that we're predestined for as believers. But the we're not predestined to be believer, become believers, as you said, Renee. But every believer is predestined for certain certain things, so um, uh, being glorified and so on. Uh, so you got it right. And uh, I'm glad I got it right now. I, I love being right. And I, if I'm wrong, uh, correct me, because uh, I've been proven wrong numerous times about things. <laughs> and I'm happy to be corrected, because I'm uh, real happy when I get it right. All right. Uh, uh, Brother Cripps, did you have anything to say about verse? Uh, did you talk about 29 and 30, Brother Cripps? No, sir. Please do. Yeah, sure. So, uh, first of all, Renee did a fantastic job, and I could, again, just say ditto, but I won't do that. So, uh, 29. Uh, now, I didn't struggle with this growing up. I didn't struggle with this verse as, mu as much as uh, it seems like people do. And I went to a, uh, grew up in a Baptist church, but it wasn't a Calvinistic Baptist church. But I had a couple people that went to my church that were trying to convince me about Calvinism, about election and whatnot. And I, I, gosh, I struggled to understand how they were coming up with this idea from this verse. Because as Renee just very well pointed out, and, and also Brother Luke pointed out as well, for whom he did foreknow, that simply means that when all the other verses in Scripture talk, talk about the nature of God, talks about that he's all-knowing, all-powerful, and he's everywhere at once. He, he's able to, these are some attributes of God. The foreknowledge part simply means that he knows the beginning from the end. He's Alpha and Omega, beginning and end. He knows everything. He was there before the foundation of the earth, and he'll be there after this particular earth passes away and the new heavens and new earth are, are, uh, are, are, are made, and we're living in those, those places. He knows everything. We don't know everything, but he does. So it's easy to, to understand the idea of him knowing ahead of time uh, all the people that would accept salvation. We still have free will. This is where the, I don't understand where the Calvinists get this, that we don't have free will because of the words being used in this verse. So uh, he, he, for no, he, for, 
Okay, he did foreknow. Uh, we understand what that word. He knows ahead of time. He already knows who those people are that are going to accept his son. He doesn't make them do that. He just has knowledge of it. So the ones that he know that he knows ahead of time will accept his son and will believe. Then here's the promise: are predestined, predestinate to be conformed, as as, as the other uh, you other two uh, folks said to be conformed. Here's the promise. We are promised that we're going to be conformed to the image of a son. We're promised that. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to, to um, lay in bed awake at night in fear that if we, if we don't wake up, you know, if we were to die while we we're sleeping, that this isn't going to happen. We know that we're going to be conformed to the image of a son. We're in the process of that now. It's already done in our spirit. Uh, our body has yet to be conformed to the image. And that, that's what it says here at the end, that we might be the firstborn among many. Jesus was the first one. He's the first and only one right now. But we will all be con we will all have that same status, that eternal body. And I agree with Renee, uh, verse 30 is just going over it again. Again, uh, in verse 30, my favorite word uh, is justified. And this is one, one of the reasons why I like Romans 5, uh, justified by faith justified just as if I'd never sinned. That, I mean, we should all be jumping up and down for joy about that word. Because of what Christ did, a belief in what he did and the resurrection makes it seem like just as if I've never sinned. And then here's the promise at the end of being glorified. We're in the process of being glorified. It's not completed yet. We're glorified. The spirit man is glorified, as I think Renee pointed out. Uh, but we don't have the the eternal body yet. But that's that's being promised to us in these verses. And uh, by the way, just so everyone knows, I can't ever be accused of this. I didn't believe uh, that what the Calvinists were trying to teach me. <laughs> that never happened. So thank you very much. Yes, I'm glad to hear that. There are some people who went through Calvinism and others that went through lordship and. Yeah, I'm thankful. I, I, I The basic uh, core doctrines that we say, these are the three core doctrines of Christianity, um, that was uh, established and uh, I understood correctly and believed correctly from the very beginnings of my faith. I never had to go through any long, any long or short periods of, of uh, you know, works or uh, any of these false teachings and you know, I know others who have and I feel for you it's it, it's tough to do that but thank you thank you Jesus I'm Brother Luke, I Fair. think that churches confuse denominations confuse more people than anything and when I stopped just stopped it all stopped the mouths of men and traditions and denominations and just sat down with God's word and if any preacher wasn't preaching free, hyper, truthful, no holds barred, wasn't ashamed of it, grace, I didn't hear a thing they had to say. I didn't listen because I could not be sure. If a, if a man has got the true gospel, then I'm willing to listen. It doesn't mean they're right on all things, but at least I'll listen. But I'll also check scripture. What I have found, if you want some clarity, is ask God to show you through the Holy Spirit, how to rightly divide his word and spend time in his word, but read it once you're saved <laughs> because you can make a mess out of it if you're not. But what, what I've seen is people get confused when they go to these churches, these denominations. And I don't want to keep anybody out of church because I do my best to support a local fellowship, even though I'm against a lot of what they teach because they're right on the gospel, you know, but just because I want to be part of a local assembly uh, and support a gospel soul willing church. But I I'm telling you, when people get out of these churches and just spend time in God's word with him showing them, I see that things clear up for them. That's what I've seen anyway. Uh, all right. Um, now, when we started tonight, I was hopeful but uh, uh, skeptical that we would get through the remainder of the chapter because at the rate we go, uh, it wasn't likely to happen. Um, so we have uh, nine verses remaining, and it's 11 p.m. Eastern time. 
So I know that to continue to finish it, we, it would we go for at least another hour or more. <laughs> so it's best to stop uh, now, I think, and try to complete this uh, next uh, next week. Um, I mean, unless you want to go a little bit further and your you know, time's no limit for you, Renee and, and Crips, but I know it's late where you are. So what do you want that, to do? Can we go, just go at least to the verses that are res referring back to the ones we just did? Because I'd hate to stop here and there's a verse below that's referring. Yeah. Okay, let's let's go. You tell me when to stop then, because I'm just uh, okay. I just want to acknowledge that since it, since it is 11 p.m. Eastern time, I don't want to push any later than need necessary. So I'll go to the next verse, and you guys uh, feel free to tell me when time's up. Okay, verse 31. What shall we say? Uh, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us. Who can be against us? Brother Cripps, why don't you go first on that one? Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's right. And he it's funny what Paul does here. So here, here you go, Brother Luke. Here's two questions. Here's two question marks in the same in the same in the same passage again. What shall we say then? He's how many times have we heard this in this Roman study? I heard Paul say this. What shall we then say to these things? It's his response to uh, all the, uh, what what we have uh, surmised or Brother Lucas pointed out, all the criticisms that he must be under, all these other people that are, are, are preaching a different gospel or they're trying to refute him, they're a thorn in the side, uh, trying to cause problems for him. So what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? It's in the form of a question, but it also is a statement. And, and he, he's saying, and I'm saying, if God be for us, who what what will stand against us? What can possibly stand against us? That, I, to me, that 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 again, that's a that's a jump up and down and clap your hands, brother Luke. Walk, uh, turn around in a circle, kind of moment right there. Nothing can stand against us. Is the answer to that question? We have the we have the Creator of all things. We have the, our Father God, who has come up with a way which comes up in verse 32 of how to reconcile us to him if he's standing with us what who can stand against us what force is there that exists that can stand against us i think that's an incredible promise personally all right renee i love that uh jason gets so happy about that because that is the summation of what he's saying here if you look prior to this verse he's saying hey you were called, you're justified, you're declared righteous, and you're going to be glorified. You're predestined to be conformed in the image of Jesus. He said, he's telling you all these things. And on top of that, he will use everything, even the evil that's done to you for your good. So he's saying, no matter what you have a, you have a promised future that you will win. You're conformed in the image of a son. You're glorified. You're declared righteous. Any evil that's done against you will be used to benefit you because he uses all things for the good of those who love him. And then he summarizes with this. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? See, it doesn't matter who's against us because whatever comes against us, God will use for our good. And we win in the end. And that is wonderful you can't get better news than that and i love how happy jason was with that news it's like amen. He's a happy dance. <laughs> amen amen thank you all right let me read that in the amplified uh 31 uh what then shall we say to all these things if god is for us who can be successful against us he who did not spare even his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Did I read the right one? No. Oh, I read verse 32. I read 31 and 32. Let me, let me, I'm going to read this whole portion here because I think it is the tail end of this is actually uh, making one point, even though there's a lot of verses. So let me, let me read the 31 as far as it's, it's making the point. Um, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with 
him also freely give us all things. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for they for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. All right, Renee. Well, I know you love those last two verses, so do I, because it just summarizes everything. And I often use that to disprove this lost salvific loss garbage I don't know how they get this because if they think you can lose it, then they think they're keeping it by something they're doing, which means they believe they're keeping it by their works, which is which is horrific. And it's scary to me. And most believe that. And so nothing can separate nothing. You know, they, they always think sin can separate. the sin was dealt with on the cross. I just wanted to mention that. But uh, to go back up here, he, he's promising, you know, he says, uh, if God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If he gave the most precious thing that's his, God, his own son for us, then how is he not going to do and give us all the things promised earlier in this chapter? He says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's God that justifieth. So nothing can, this is another good eternal security verse. Because what can accuse us? It says that Satan accuses us day and night before the Lord. But we're under the blood. The, uh, Jesus is like, they're under me. They're mine. Nobody can lay a charge to us. Nobody can condemn us. Why? Because it's God that justified us to begin with. He's the one that gave us his own righteousness on our accounts. We are perfect. People forget this. You have to be perfect. I mean, perfect without any sin. That's why I don't understand these people that think they repented of sin. They haven't repented of all their sins. They still sin. And if you press them, they'll admit that since they're saved, which I don't believe they were saved at all to begin with, that since then they've still sinned, which discounts the whole perfection required for heaven. So the only way to get perfect is God's righteousness imputed on you. So it's God that justifies. It's God that makes me holy and blameless and perfect and sinless. It's God that did it. So who can accuse me when I've got God's own righteousness, when it's God himself that made me perfect? And who is he that condemns? It's Christ that died. Yea, rather it's risen again, who is even at the right hand of God who make us intercession. So not only is it God that makes us uh, holy and just and imputes his righteousness, Jesus is sitting there making intercession on top of it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword, nothing on this earth. And then he goes on to uh, give these people hope because they are being persecuted. They are being put to death for their faith. We've got to remember this. He is not only trying to strengthen their faith when they waver, but these people are being put to death for their faith. It's written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted sheep for the slaughter. That's an Old Testament verse. It is a prophecy that Paul is using, showing that that is being fulfilled in their time. 
Nay, and all these things were more than conquerors for him that loved us. So it doesn't even matter if they kill us. We still win. Why? Go back up in the chapter. Because his promise is we're predestined to be conformed in the image of his son. We're justified. We're called. We are glorified. That is a promise. So it doesn't even matter if they kill us. And then he confirms with, I am persuaded. I am convinced that death, life, nor angels, nor principalities, that's angels or fallen angels over an area that control that area, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. So nothing in the past, nothing happening now, and nothing in the future nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be. And that includes you as a creature, by the way, you can't separate you from the love of God in Christ shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Our Lord, he's confirming no matter what happens, no matter what they do to you, even if they kill you, you still win. You still win. And nothing separates us. I, I don't know why people can't understand that these verses say that nothing in the past, nothing now, and nothing in the future can separate you from God. Once you are in Christ, no charge can, no, no uh, accusation will stick to you in God's eyes. Uh, nothing. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God in Christ. He will never leave you or forsake you. And it's not based on you but on God's promises and God's faithfulness, not your own. I, I love how he, he just closes that chapter so intensely. It's just an awesome set of verses. Yeah. Okay. Brother Cripps? Yeah, sure. So uh, right in 32, we have the down payment that, when we all look at what, what he's already given, he's given his precious only son and he sent him to this earth to die our death. He died the death that we don't have to die. Yes, this physical body dies, but oh gosh, you have to understand that that's nothing like we deserve. Everything that we deserve was put on Christ. So he gave his one only son that he loved dearly uh, for us. So why would we expect that he would not give us all the other things that he's promised us? He's given up that one thing, the one thing that he that he loved most for us. So we can expect that he's going to fulfill all the rest of his promises. We have that. All of us that believe know that, that, that that's exactly what's happening here. It's reconciling us to him. Uh, verse 33. Oh, keeps moving around. 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Now, so every time that those of us who rely on his grace, when people say, oh, you guys are greasy grace, you guys are, you know, easy believing, you guys are this or that, that Brother Luke uh, rightly hates, and I agree with him 100%. Uh, this is the, your answer to that. If you're if you're being attacked by other people and and saying that if you believe in grace instead of works, that, 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 that you're going to hell, there's some, any problem, here it is. Um, nobody who, who, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect. It is God that justifies not build down the street, not any Lordship pastor, not anyone that's accusing you of anything. Nobody on this earth, uh, has justified you and made it as if you've never sinned. God alone does that. Verse 34, who is it that, who is it that he condemneth? Is it Christ that died? Yea, rather that the risen again, um, and also, I love this idea again. The, so he's up there making intercession for us right now. Not only is he not dead, but he's risen again. He's making intercession for us and continues to do that until we do get the eternal bodies. That's happening right now as we speak. A anything that you're going through in your life right now, you're being intercessed for. Uh, 35, who shall separate us from love of Christ? Okay, so again, it's 35 is making the point that nothing will separate us. Nothing is going to separate us. Nothing is going to separate us. We need to remember that. There, there's nothing in the earth, above the earth, outside of the earth, none of that. Nothing's going to separate us. Uh, 36, as written, for the sake we were killed all the day long. This is happening, and and I think that's the, the that's been pointed out enough what that's referring to. Uh, we're pretty fortunate here in America, at least at the present time, we might get, you know, uh, some verbal persecution, stuff like that. 
Uh, there are countries right now that people are dying for believing in, in, in Christ. That's, that is happening. For us, right now at least, it's not happening. But there will be some of that later. Uh, 37, nay, there are all these things. We're more than conquerors. Okay, this is one that I love absolutely. We're more than conquerors. Do you know what that means? What does more than conquerors mean? So if someone's a conqueror, we're more than that. How is that even possible? I, we, we have everything. We have everything because of what Christ did. All right, so 38, for I'm persuaded neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities, powers, things present nor things to come. Now, what other verse does that remind everyone of? It, it reminds us of what we wrestle against. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. So he's persuading that none of these things can stand against us, none of these powers. And also, again, no thing coming. So there's no thing ahead of us that's going to that's gonna separate us, nothing. There's no things in the past, present, or future that's going to separate us. 39, nor height nor depth. He's just continuing the same point. Any creature, I think Renee did a good job with that. I don't need to say anything more. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. Nothing. That's it. I, 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 that's it. <laughs> Nothing will separate us from the love of God. We're more than conquerors because of what he did for us. He's intercessing for us right now. And we can come on that. We can bake on that. And uh, he's he's already put the down payment on on for us, which is Christ Christ's death on the cross is the down payment for our eternal bodies. We can be guaranteed. I, I'm sure there's a lot of people that aren't old enough to remember layaway. I don't know if they even still do that any, anymore. It's it's layaway, except for instead of us paying for it, it's already been paid for. We just haven't received it yet. Thanks so much. I love that, Jay-Z. You said a down payment for our eternal bodies. That's awesome. No, thanks. <laughs> Praise mm -hmm. God. Okay. Uh, now, I think that there are some people in the congregation who have uh, been with us for all or much of this study of the Book of Romans. If you're someone that has not start, been with us from the beginning, we did an introduction to the book, and then we started with one chapter one and two. And as we progress through this, it's all connected. And one of the things that we've been saying throughout is that Paul uses various techniques. And uh, it's interesting that I, I bet you there's no chapter in the Bible that has as many question marks as chapter eight. But in the book of Romans, there's a lot of question marks. Probably in the rest of his letters there are too, but in this one I'm certain it's filled with question marks. And we wonder, well, why? Why this style of him asking all these questions? And, and he's asking questions because these are the questions that are around the church at that time. And, and look at this. Let's connect the end of this chapter to the, uh, the earlier verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So earlier in this chapter, we went into great detail talking about these things and saying that, look, what existed at that time in place, if you want context of who Paul's talking to and what he's talking about, is that there are false teachers coming into the Paul, Paul's churches saying Paul's a false teacher, teaching a false gospel that can't save you. You need to get circumcised and, and keep the Sabbaths and follow the laws of Moses and even go to the temple and do animal sacrifices. This was the what was being taught by uh, these, what these were called Judaizers, these people who were saying Judaism is still required. And that was causing people to have doubts and fears. Paul said one thing. The other teachers are saying something else. It's much like what's happening in our churches today. You know, we tell you salvation is a free gift, and it's guaranteed. You can't lose it. Other people come along and say, no, no, no. You've got to repent of your sins, and you better keep your fingers crossed. Hopefully you've been good enough, or you could lose it. 
And especially if you ever have a doubt and fear and lose your faith, then you're really in trouble. You need you lost your salvation or you weren't really saved. So all these things are causing fear. And that same scenario existed in the Roman church at that time. Yeah, so, they say uh, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ, except if you sin too much. <laughs> yeah, or or have, as it says here, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. There's yep. a new verse there that actually has the word, let me look at it, uh, doubt. It has the word doubt in it. Uh, yep. We were talking about that. Is Where is that? Uh, I thought it was in this verse here. Uh, if you see it, let me know. Yeah, but even if our faith fails, you know. Uh -huh. uh, I, I'm glad you're mentioning that because there's a lot of teaching that if you're saved, your faith won't fail. And that, that's not true. Mm -hmm. I've heard of uh, great men of God that have gone to prison for years and been tortured and their faith was shaken. They hung in there, but their faith was shaken. They got, you know, they went through a lot. The flesh is weak. Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, I know there's a verse in here, and I'm not only talking about fear, but but uh, doubts. And so the point is, Paul why, Paul doesn't say anything just because he's entertaining, or just because oh, a thought came into my mind, I thought I'd share this with you. Everything he does is a response to what's happening in the church. There's all kinds of problems. Prob Paul is a problem solver, and, and uh, he wants people to, to have the blessed assurance. They're having all these fears like Dan in the chat room. Oh, I'm, I'm worried sometimes I'm having some doubts and, uh, and fears and stuff. Look, it still happens all the time today in the church. And we, we argue, well, Maybe they never believed. Maybe they never got saved, or maybe they got saved and now they're uh, they're just uh, you know suffering with doubts, and but they're still saved. And uh, okay, that's not the, the the issue here. Is they've had doubts, and Paul is saying, this, God did not give you the spirit of fear. Stop being afraid that you're not really saved, or you could lose your salvation. And then he ends up saying. And this is what I'm persuaded, and this is what I, I believe for a person to be a Christian. We talk about what the gospel is, and people say there's all kinds of things that are part of understanding the gospel. The, the deity of Christ, uh, the, the death for our sins, the resurrection, faith alone in Christ alone. All these things are integral in, understand, in, in, in this gift. Uh, but... There are people who actually believe that Jesus, God came down from heaven, became Jesus, and Jesus died on a cross and paid for our sins, and he was raised from the dead bodily. And then you ask them, are you certain you're going to go to heaven and why? They say, well, you can't be certain. That's the sin of presumption. Who can know? I got my fingers crossed. I'm doing the best I can, and I'm hoping I'm good enough. So uh, believing the facts, getting your facts straight about who Jesus is and what he's done is not that now that's important. We need to understand that. But we need to understand that because of that, because of who he is, because of what he's done, because of his promise, we need to believe that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principles, Paladies, nor powers, nor things to present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love uh, of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, you need to understand and believe that because he paid for our sins, we have this certainty, this promise, this guarantee. I am persuaded nothing can take away my salvation. It's absolutely guaranteed and certain. And without that, I don't think you even understand the gospel. And if you have that, you should not forget it and be led astray by false teachers to take away that blessed assurance. But there are babes, I believe, who they understand it correctly, and yet they get a silver-tongued devil and they don't understand the scriptures as well. And then, and, and so a silver tongue lordship heretic comes and persuades them that no, Paul was wrong. Just like the Judaizers were saying, no, Paul was wrong. It's not faith alone. 
you got to do some works and you can lose it if you're not careful. And they get these doubts, even though they had this joy and blessed assurance initially. Uh, so I think that does happen. And, and uh, but under what the gospel really is, is this understanding that, hey, I've come to the realization I'm going to heaven. Nothing can separate me. Nothing can change that. Paul went into great detail to explain, not this, not this, not this, not this, not this. He tried to put everything on that list, any possible conceivable scenario, and say, none of those things can change my salvation. That's what we need to understand as we get saved. And then if we keep that in mind, we'll always have the joy and peace of the blessed assurance. All right, uh, I guess we've uh, gone uh, two hours instead of 90 minutes. It's 1130. And we got through it. We kind of rushed through it. But all these these last nine verses are all part of one main thought, right? So I guess it worked out. Uh, why don't you take each take a, a, a minute or two and give us a summary of your, your thoughts on the whole study? Uh, Re Renee or Brother Cripps, I'll let you go first this time. Yeah, let him, let him go first. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brother Luke. Thank you, Renee. Yeah. So the, the the this whole verse tonight that we started out with is about hope. And then what Paul does, he takes the whole verse and it's a buildup. It's like he starts out with the, the main thought about the hope that we have. And he builds and builds and builds and builds until the end, the last verse. And he, he tells us all the things, as Brother Luke just said, it tells us all the things that have no effect on what, what Christ did on the cross for us, that no one can take away his gift from us. Again and again and again, he pounds at it. And I love how he always does this. He doubles down on the same things over and over and over again, and he, he just pounds on it. And the reason why he pounded on it, I mentioned this earlier, is because he there were false teachers at the time that were saying that he was a false teacher. There are people trying to convince others that the, the same gospel, which he already preached to them, was was somehow uh, not the correct one. So he's he keeps having to say these things over and over again. And here's the reason why, is because people are still going into the same things now. There's still people, there's, there's don't even look at it, but there are groups out there right now, Hebrew Roots Movement and some other things, that are drawing people back under the law. That you had that you have to obey the Mosaic law in order to be saved. They're at, they're they're making it a point of contention again and again and again. And if people don't understand these verses that he keeps going at over and over and over again, he keeps pounding on these points that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing, 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 nothing. Then you could be easily swayed by any wind of doctrine. You can be swayed, and you can go into doubt, and you can go into thinking you're not saved. We don't have to do that. He's promised us. He's put the down payment, as I was talking about earlier. That I, I, I love, I love how that plays out. He's the down payment on our on our eternal bodies. He he's he's proved that to us. We so if we believe in what he did on the cross, then we also must believe in all the promises that have yet to be be be, be fulfilled. We don't let anyone take that away from us. We don't have to. And lastly, I just want to say that the more we keep our eyes on Jesus, you don't have to worry about all this stuff. He hasn't given us the spirit of fear. We don't have to go back under, under bondage to fear again. He's freed us from that. We're free from that because of what he did. We don't have to rely on ourselves. He's responsible for that. It's already been taken care of. All we need to do is rest in him. And we wake up every day. We put on our spiritual armor. And uh, he, he renews our mind. He transforms us by the daily renewing of our minds. Keep your eyes on him. Keep reminding yourself. And the Holy Spirit will do this for you, as, as these passages are saying. Not only do we have an intercessor, but we have the Holy Spirit in us, and he works in our lives. He works through us. And he reminds us through our own prayer, through that relationship with him, he keeps reminding us every day that Jesus finished the work. There's nothing for us to do. There's no works to add to it. Jesus alone, through faith, with nothing added. You don't have to add anything to it. You don't have to fear. You don't have to worry. It's all taken care of already. Just focus on him. That's all we have to do. Keep focusing in on him. Keeping our eyes on him. 
And uh, yeah, we don't have to, no matter what anyone on the outside says, we don't have to listen to them at all. We listen to what Paul's saying here and what Jesus has written on our hearts to trust in him and believe in him, believe on him, believe in him, and nothing else will ever separate us from that. Praise God. Amen. Renee, will you sum up your thoughts on this study? Yeah, I'm glad uh, Jason mentioned that Paul pounds at home. And this is why he was mentioning the Hebrew rooters too. I don't know why anybody would want to, somebody was asking, do we have to keep the Jewish feast? These things were shadows of the good thing to come, which is Jesus. Why would you focus on a shadow instead of the good thing that manifested that shadow? Now, if you want to, you know, adhere to the feast because you want to honor what Jesus did, great. But none of that saves you. You know, you're not bound to anything. Anything that's of bondage and commanded for salvation is not salvation. Salvation should point only to Christ. Like Jason said, we rest in him. And it's funny because there's a lot of Hebrew rooters. They're not even Jewish. They pretend and claim their ancestry is Hebrew, but they're not. They're like Irish or something because they get street cred for their false teaching. It's it's laughable, but it's scary. Um, so the whole thing tonight is what Jason said. It was about hope. And then it was confirming that hope that God's promises are true. They're more than a hope. They are a promise. We're looking forward to something that we know is coming. Then he goes in to tell us how we, uh, we are called and chosen and justified and glorified and that nothing, no matter what's done to us will be used for our good. And even if we're killed as we're sleep sheep to the slaughter, we still win because we're glorified. So it, it Nothing can separate. Even our own physical death doesn't separate us from it. We're absent from the body to be present with the Lord. Now, Paul really pounds things home. And that is why so many false teachers today are trying to disprove Paul is a true apostle. They're trying to say that what Paul taught, he's not a real apostle. He wasn't one of the original 12 and if that's the case, then we got to throw out a third of the New Testament. We got to throw all that out. And they hate Paul because Paul is so adamant about saying it's not of yourselves. It's not of works. It's by grace. It's grace. It's grace. It's only what Jesus did. And they hate it because there's no way you can take Paul's writings and add works to it. And so they try to take him out. But that gets very dangerous because now you're saying there's error in God's word. And so which parts do we believe? Only the parts that we think we can achieve by our works. So I love this section of scripture. I love that we at least uh, touched on Calvin's false predestination doctrine that, you know, we're saved. We're predestined to be made in the image of Jesus. Every saved person is. And no matter what. Nothing can come against us. Nothing can accuse us. Nothing can make us separated from God's love. Nothing can make us lost once we've been saved. And that really, really is good news. Amen. Yeah. Well, um, I already kind of summarized it last, my last turn, uh, trying to connect the dots about from the beginning of the book of Romans up to this point, uh, what what we need to keep in mind, what's going on at that time and place in history. Um, so I just want to urge everybody, if you have not been here from the beginning and listened to, to every single one of these studies, it's very important that you go and start from the beginning and work your way all the way through to this present point. And, the other thing, uh, uh, next week, we'll begin the chapter nine. And chapter nine is the reason Calvinism exists. Because uh, Augustine, and, and then Calvin is nothing more than teaching what Augustine taught, they misunderstand what is said in chapter nine they come up with this problems with Calvinism and 
and then because they misunderstand Romans 9, they're forced into a corner and they have to then redefine many words in the Bible that are simple English, like whosoever, all, world, all these words that we understand the basic meaning, they have to redefine them all to make the Bible conform to their false philosophy. And that whole false philosophy can be uh, originated with not understanding Romans 9. So I want to ask everybody for next Wednesday, please tell all your friends and family, especially if they have any questions about Calvinism and, and Romans 9 to join us. I've, I've done a lot of preparation for that chapter 9. And uh, I'm very eager to, to get into it. Uh, all right. So uh, I guess that's it. Uh, thank you, uh, Renee and uh, Brother Cripps, uh, for joining me again tonight. And thanks every, to everybody in the chat room. Don't forget to uh, join me Friday night. Uh, I'll be interviewing uh, Brother David from uh, Talk and Doctrine. He does the Friday Fundamentals. And right following that, we'll do an interview of David. And then Sunday, of course, join us for our Church of the Eternally Secure program. Uh, I will tell you now that uh, Brother uh, Jack Smack has sent me a number of questions that he wants the panel to answer th this next Sunday. And there are some really, really interesting questions. And he says, help me. I don't know the answers to these questions. So he needs help with them. And... I'm sure that because he's been asked these questions and he doesn't know what to say. So I'm excited for that for that this Sunday. Uh, all right. So uh, thank you all and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus. <laughs>